So today we are meeting um, the British author uh, Ruth Ware, uh, which Romanian readers know uh, from the books uh, In a Dark, Dark Wood, The Woman in Cabin 10, The Lying Game, and The Death of Mrs. Westaway. And uh, I must tell you that uh, Romanian readers just love your books. Oh, uh, thank you so much. That makes me so happy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is an interview for our uh, Romanian uh, uh, online uh, book fair, Elephant Fest. My first question for you is, uh, how did you start writing uh, for uh, this genre? Because I know you, you wrote before uh, young fiction. I did, yes. I wrote for teenagers before starting to write crime. Um, well, I suppose I really owe it to, to um, a friend. Um, I'd written in all different genres growing up. I've written, you know, sci-fi, romance, fantasy, anything that I was reading. And then when I first started writing for publication, I was writing fiction for teenagers. But I always loved reading crime, even though I'd never tried writing it. And I was a thriller junkie. And I was having coffee with a friend one day, and she said that she had never read a thriller set on a hen night. And as soon as she said it, I thought, wow, this is a book I would love to read. And then I realized that it didn't exist. And that if I wanted to find out what happened on this, I was going to have to write it myself. So I sat on the train on the way home and these characters were just kind of walking on inside my head. And by the time I got home, I realized that this was a book I really, really wanted to write. Um, so in that sense, I kind of didn't sit down and decide to write crime in a way crime came and chose me um yeah <laughs> and the, the rest you know ha happened from there yeah great great story um let's talk about um, your books uh, th that are published in romania also in a dark dark wood uh, what was the inspiration behind the book and uh, especially its title because it sounds uh, like a like a rhyme. It, well, it is, yeah. So the title comes from a traditional English nursery rhyme, I guess, um, which goes in a dark, dark wood, there was a dark, dark house, and in the dark, dark house, there was a dark, dark room, and so on and so on and so on until you get there. And there was a dark, dark cupboard, and in the dark, dark cupboard, there was a skeleton. And then when you say <laughs> you jump out, and the children all scream, and it's, you know, it's, it's telling to really little children, really. Um, an initial spark for the book came from the conversation with the friend I was telling you about. Um, so I knew right from the beginning that it was going to be a book about people on a hen night or a bachelorette party. Um, and the wonderful thing about that is that it brings together all different people from all parts of your life. You know, you have friends from work, you have friends from when you were at school, you have friends from university, you have friends who you just happen to know through shared interests. And the interesting thing about it is that it really shows up how we are different people at different times in our lives and how we put on different personas and different faces when we're talking to different people in our lives. So this is exactly what the book is about. It's about a woman who's getting married and she invites friends from way back, including the narrator, who was a friend of hers at school, um, as well as friends from the person she is today. And you start to realise that everybody in the book is putting on something of an act. Um, and the book takes place in a forest because I knew when I was writing it that I wanted, um, I didn't want the characters to be able to call for help very easily. And obviously <laughs> in today's, you know, modern environment, yeah. mobile phones and everything, that means that you have to take them somewhere where there is no mobile phone coverage. And in the UK, that is, quite a limited number of places now um, but one of the places where it is possible to get right away is um, Northumberland and the Kielder Forest which is where the book is set and there's spots of that where still you know the shape of the hills and things mean that there's really no mobile reception at all. Um, so I was thinking about kind of woods and forests when I started writing but of course it's also a book about having secrets and having skeletons in your cupboard. Um, I don't know if that expression translates into Romanian. Yes, yes, we have it. The idea of having a secret that you don't want to get out. 
and somehow the rhyme in a dark dark wood that ends up with a skeleton coming out of a closet just seemed to sum up all of those different parts of the plot yeah it's it's fantastic to to step in the mind of a writer and to see behind the <laughs> behind the book um, it had a title from very early on which not all of my books do i don't always have a title when i start and sometimes i have a title but it's one that changes or my publishers don't like it or it doesn't quite work in America or something. But this book was called In a Dark Dark Wood right from the beginning and it, that's what it ended up being in most places where it was published. Yeah. The Woman in Cabin 10, I, I felt it like, a, like an homage to Agatha Christie. Uh, the posh, <laughs> the posh uh, cruise line, the atmosphere, um, even dialogues uh, very much so, yeah yeah uh, uh, have you intended to to write it that way to be an homage to Agatha Christie absolutely um so I think that came from when I was writing in a dark dark wood my inspirations for that came much more from kind of horror films and the sort of the kind of final girl genre of horror you know where a group of teenagers mm -hmm goes into a wood and only one of them comes out and there's like a you know there's maybe there's someone in the woods and that scene where you know you go around and you check all of the doors and you think maybe the killer is out there all of that was directly taken from that genre but when the book was published people began to compare it to Agatha Christie quite quickly in fact my agent um who I was the first person to read the book as soon as she read it said gosh this is like a modern Agatha Christie um, and I can see why, because um, Agatha Christie was one of the first crime writers that I ever read. And I think she really imprinted on me the idea of what a perfect crime is. And the idea of having a puzzle that clicks into place when you have all of the pieces, suddenly everything makes sense. To me, that's the perfect outcome for a crime novel. So I was writing The Woman in Cabin 10 as all of these reviews for In a Dark Dark Wood were appearing. And it made me realize how much inspiration I had taken from Christy for that book. And so I guess with The Woman in Cabin 10, I just wanted to be a little bit more overt about saying thank you to her and kind of paying homage to the way that she shaped the crime genre and how so many of the things that we take for granted today, like the unreliable narrator and so on, are techniques that she either in some cases invented or in other cases perfected or made popular. Um, and what Christie does so well, I think, is that atmosphere of stifled luxury where you have yeah. what seems to be a perfect setting like the Orient Express train or a Dahabia on the Nile or a beautiful country house somewhere that seems completely enviable and very luxurious and very comfortable. But she shows you the kind of the darkness running underneath and the inequalities and the cracks and the fact that evil can really be anywhere. And she's very good at transforming what feels like a completely golden opportunity into something of a prison. And so that's definitely one of the things I was trying to do with that book was to create a beautiful setting and turn it into a nightmare. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it was a masterpiece. Oh, thank uh, you. I had great fun writing that book. So. <laughs> um, uh, let's uh, talk about The Lying Game. Uh, for me, it was, besides the plot, uh, it's a book about uh, friendship, uh, female friendship. Uh, that friendship that you uh, start in, in the teenage years and uh, it uh, uh, come, uh, come with you uh, all the life. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think that's the reason. Well, so I think the reason I partly, the reason I decided to tackle that was because when In a Dot Dot Wood came out, one of the very first quotes about it said, it does for female friendship what Gone Girl did for marriage. 
and yeah. if you've read Gone Girl by Gillian Flynn it's a very yeah. toxic portrayal of a marriage and the friendships in In a Dark Dark Wood are very toxic but I started to feel slightly guilty about all of my amazing female friends, many of whom I've been friends with since primary school. Um, and I'm still friends with many of them today. And I started to think that I wanted to write something much more positive about friendship um, and something that shows how amazing women can be to each other and how they will go to the ends of the earth to support their friends, even in the most dire circumstances. Um, but because I'm a crime writer, it turns <laughs> into something a little bit darker and a little bit more twisted than that. But I think the core of it is exactly that. It's a book about the power of friendship, but it's also a book about the point in our lives when those friendships start to get strained. So when we're young, our friendships are everything to each other and we will sacrifice almost anything for our friends. But as you get older, your loyalties start to shift. And first of all, you have maybe a partner and then you have kids. And at that point, your family becomes the most important thing in your life, your partner or your children or, or you know, yes. or whatever shape your family ends up being. That becomes your priority. Mm -hmm. And at that point, it can become the old ties are still just as important, but they can become much more stressed and strained because you're really having to balance your priorities in a way that you never had to before um so i guess in that book i was trying to talk about that moment when the scale suddenly shifts and to show someone who's really struggling to be a good friend but also a good parent and i think that's something that isa does all the way through the book it's the reason she's a mother um she's constantly pulled two ways and she's always faced with the choice between being a bad friend or a bad wife or a bad mum there's like there's always competing things um yeah so i i guess it was me sort of trying to talk a little bit about the point in my life that i'd come to in some respects yeah uh now uh we are um uh, in the death of mrs westaway <laughs> shelf uh, we have we have here a female character uh, which has a, a very funny occupation uh, she she earns uh, her living uh, from tarot cards car tarot readings how <laughs> how did you came with that idea of introducing tarot cards in a, a crime well <laughs> I think because I had started off writing three novels about ordinary women who were in the wrong place at the wrong time. So Nora in In a Dark Dark Wood, Lo in The Woman in Cabin 10, Isa in The Lion Game, they're just regular every women with faults and problems, but you know, basically they happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and something terrible happens to them. So when I sat down to write book four, I thought I want to do something a bit different. I want to write about a character who brings the action of the novel upon themselves. Someone who sets out to commit a crime um, and is morally quite a grey person, you know, um, maybe a bit of an anti-hero in a way. And so yeah. I was thinking about all of the anti-heroes in novels that I love, you know, like the talented Mr. Ripley and... Um, the secret history, you know, characters who are really right on the edge, ethically. Um, and I knew that I wanted to write a book about um, inheritance. And um, I decided to write a story about someone who decides to claim an inheritance that isn't theirs, which is what happens in the death of Mrs. Westway. Um, so Hal is presented with a letter. Um, she's told that she's inherited a substantial sum of money from her grandmother, mm -hmm. but she can tell from the letter that it wasn't meant for her, that actually the real you know, beneficiary is someone else completely. But because she's in a very difficult financial position, she decides to go ahead and claim the inheritance anyway. And then I was faced with the problem of how do I create a character who would feel themselves equipped to do this? Because it's a huge thing to go to a 
a house full of strange people and decide that you are going to persuade them that you're their long lost granddaughter. And so I thought, right, she needs to have some sort of skills in reading people and deceiving people already so that she feels able to do this. So I started off thinking about making her a fake medium um, mm. because I love the idea of someone who kind of cold reads other people and sort of can tell things about people from their appearance in a sort of Sherlock Holmes type way. Um, but then I decided maybe that was a little bit too cynical. Um, so then I decided tarot cards was kind of the perfect like middle point. So um, how is a tarot reader, but she is a cynical tarot reader. So she doesn't believe in the magic of the card. She bases her readings entirely on what she guesses or perceives about the person sitting opposite her. Um, so she's not exactly lying to people, but she's also not exactly telling the truth. So it was a nice kind of <laughs> nice grey area to work with. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Uh, I know that um, the books in a dark, dark wood, uh, the woman in cabin ten and the lying game have been optioned for film and TV. Do you know uh, uh, how these projects are going now? I don't really. I mean, I've sort of waved them off to their film and television production companies um, and I get periodic updates, but none of them have got as far as actually filming yet, but they're all still under option and in development. So mm -hmm. I guess it's just a question of seeing which one crosses the finishing line first. <laughs> uh, and uh, were you involved in the script writing? No, some of the companies asked me if I wanted to be involved, but really, partly I don't know anything about writing a script, and partly I'm always under deadline with my novels. Um, I find it difficult enough writing a novel a year, let alone writing a script on top of that. And partly I just felt like it would be too difficult to adapt my own books. I think you have to be quite ruthless when you adapt a book to television yeah. or film you have to figure out what is working about that and what isn't going to translate to a visual medium. And I wasn't sure if I would be the best person to do that. I wasn't sure if I would have the courage to say, this scene won't work on screen, we need to scrap it. Whereas I feel that then would be easier to make if you are a disinterested person. Yeah, sounds like you're butchering your own work. <laughs> Exactly. It must, it must yeah. be painful, yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. Sort of like doing surgery on yourself. I think it's best left up to other people. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, let's go back a bit uh, to your writing process. Uh, which comes to you first? Uh, the plot, characters, uh, the ending, maybe a first phrase, the major twist? Uh, it's really up. difficult. They're all, all my novels are different. Um, the way I usually work, I plan quite a long way in ahead. So generally, I start to think about the book I will write next as I get to the end of the book I'm currently writing. Um, so normally, while I'm editing, I'm kind of thinking about the next book, I'm turning over ideas, I'm thinking about characters. So by the time I sit down and start to write the book, I normally have a pretty good idea of who the characters are, where the novel is set, what happens. Um, and I don't plan it out in great detail um, in terms of I don't write anything down. I don't, you know, plot out every scene. I don't write a detailed synopsis. Um, but I usually know a lot about the, where I'm starting mm -hmm. in terms of characters and the setting. And I almost always know the end in the sense of I know who did it and why. Um, and I think that's really important for a mystery writer. I know some writers who don't work like that. But for me, I think the perfect kind of mystery novel is the one where you get to the end and you have, you're presented with the solution and your reaction is, of course. Of course, I should have realised this. I had all the information. I saw all the clues, I just didn't put it together. But of course, in order to have all the information and to receive all the clues, the author needs to put them there, which means the author needs to know what the solution is. So in order to give the readers a fair chance at solving the mystery, 
you have to know the solution right at the beginning. And often the clue to the twist or the clue to the solution is there right in the first few chapters of my book, but it's not clear unless you know what you're looking for. Um, but in terms of in terms of what comes first, sometimes it is a character, sometimes it's a place. With the Lion Game, the setting is this um, very spooky tide mill in, mm -hmm. in a fishing village, and that was a real place in northern France that I visited. But I picked it up and moved it across the Channel and put it in southern England because I wanted my book to be set in England. <laughs> Uh, but the tide mill is real, the village with its fishing nets is all real. Um, but plotting characters are, to me anyway, so tied together that it's very difficult to separate them because crime plots, at any rate, don't usually centre on big external events. They centre on people, it's people doing things to other people. And so plot is character and character is plot because any event comes down to who would have done that and how would the person on the other end feel about it, which comes back to character. So it's a kind of circular question in a way. <laughs> yeah. Um, before uh, writing, I think you, you must be a great reader. I, uh, I read myself about you that you, uh, you you read the, the classics and i want to ask you if there is any book that is very 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 important to you a book that you would take with you on an island oh it's such a difficult question um i find it impossible to pick one book in these situations because i am a very prolific reader i read a lot um, I studied English at university, so as part of that I had to read all the classics going right back to Chaucer and Shakespeare and um, you know, the Mort d'Arthur. Um, so it's very difficult for me to pick one book out of all of the books that I've read. Um, I would say the two books that have probably had the biggest influence on my writing are probably um, well, either Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier mm -hmm. or My Cousin Rachel, also by Daphne du Maurier. They sort of have very similar qualities in that they have a very atmospheric setting. Um, they have quite an unreliable narrator in some ways. Um, it's someone who has their own kind of preoccupations and um, their own assumptions that they're forcing on you. So you see the plot entirely through their prejudices and their preconceptions. Um, and the other novel in terms of structure um, is probably And Then There Were None by Agatha Christie, which is really beautifully structured, really hard to guess if you're reading it for the first time without knowing the solution. And when you get to the end, it is a real, of course, moment <laughs> where you, you think you should have got it and you, you hopefully didn't. Um, whether those are my all-time favourite books, whether I would want to read them on a desert island, I don't know. I actually love reading humour, and at the moment I'm finding myself reading more and more humorous books because, <laughs> you know, the news is quite grim and quite depressing, and we're facing such problems in the world that it feels all the more important to to keep smiling in literature. So, yeah. Um... We just made offers for uh, The Turn of the Key and One by One. So very soon, <laughs> Romanian readers will, uh, will have also these books. Uh, please uh, tell us about each, uh, each of them uh, to make a teaser for the, for the next uh, books. Well, so The Turn of the Key um, takes uh, inspiration from a completely different novel, um, The Turn of the Screw, as you might be able to tell from the title by Henry James. And um, it opens with my narrator in prison. Um, she's on remand for a, a crime that she says she didn't commit, which means that she's going to be tried for it, but she hasn't yet been tried and found guilty or innocent. 
and she's writing to a lawyer that she hopes will represent her at her trial. And she's trying to persuade him that she's innocent. So she goes back to the beginning and she explains how she's ended up here. Um, and she tells him that um, it all started when she saw an advertisement in online. She was looking for something else completely. And it was for a nannying position to look after um, some kids in a house in the Scottish Highlands. And she goes up and does the interview for the post. And it just seems too good to be true. The salary is really enviable. The house is this beautiful, smart house, which is fitted out with cameras and electronics and speakers and all mod cons. And the family seems really adorable. There's these two cute little girls. There's these really nice parents. Um, and so she offered the post and accepts it. But of course, she finds out that it is too good to be true and that the house is very far from perfect. And this um, it's controlled by an app through a home hub, which immediately starts malfunctioning and everything doesn't work. She can't control the lights. She thinks that the parents are spying on her through the cameras. She hears creepy noises all the time. The kids are not perfect. They're very troubled, very disobedient. The parents disappear almost immediately, leaving her alone in this house. But it turns out that she is not perfect either. And she has a reason of her own for coming to the house, which she is keeping secret and which she doesn't tell you for quite some time. Um, and of course, what you know from the beginning is that the novel ends up with one of the children she is looking after being killed. Um, so the whole story kind of wends its way to this um, to this finishing point. Um, but the inspiration came from The Turn of the Screw, um, which is, of course, about a nanny in a house with two small children thinking that the house is haunted. And that's one of the questions in The Turn of the Key is, is all of this in her head? Is someone playing tricks on her? Is it malfunctioning technology? Or is there something else? going on something supernatural um, so that was that was really fun to write um, and the next novel after that one by one is completely different again um, it's also about technology but there's nothing ghostly about this one um, it's set in a luxurious uh, chalet in the French Alps and it's the first of my books that has two narrators so one narrator is the chalet girl and um, she's the hostess for the chalet and is in charge of it. The book opens with her setting the chalet up for a group of people. And you find out that the people who are coming to stay are a group of app developers who've developed this incredibly popular music app that is the subject of a huge acquisition offer. So they've been offered like a billion dollars and they've come to the chalet to try to decide whether to accept this offer or whether to stay independent and maybe make more money in the long run by taking the company public. Um, the company is completely split. Half of them want to um, half of them want to accept the buyout offer and half of them want to reject it. Um, and you discover that uh, my other narrator was the secretary for the company a long, long time ago, back when she was like, you know, in her early 20s. And she has ended up with a tiny shareholding in the company, which ultimately gives her the deciding vote on whether this buyout offer will go through or not. Um, so she's having pressure put on her from both sides. And halfway through this, there's an enormous avalanche and one of the founders of the company goes missing in the snow. So it takes quite a lot of inspiration from um, And Then There Were None um, in that it's a novel about people in a very isolated environment being picked off one by one, hence the title. Um, but yeah, it was huge, huge fun to write. I, I really enjoyed doing it. Um. <laughs> Great. I think Romanian readers are waiting. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Ruth Ware, for being with us today. Um, um having me it was my pleasure thank you for uh, for your stories they are great and um, we are expect expecting the next novel <laughs> the oh. next after one by one <laughs> i hope it's worth the wait and um thank you very much i hope you have a wonderful book fair
Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Bye.